Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first of our three-part briefing series, Reduce and Reuse, How to Cut Greenhouse Gas Emissions from of Building Materials, Plastics, and Food. Today, we will kick off with Building Materials from Production to Reuse. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director at the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. The best way to stay informed about our latest educational resources is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's a little hard for me to believe, but our briefings today, tomorrow, and Friday are the last of 2021. Our session today is our 26th of the year, and we knew when we started way back on January 29th with our first briefing of the year um, that this would be uh, a year very critical for climate change. We were hopeful for an infrastructure package, broader investments in new policies from Congress, higher appropriations for federal programs, and a return to U.S. leadership on the global stage, and in particular at COP26. We still have a few more weeks to go before 22, 2022 gets here, um, so more things will happen. Um, but given that level of ambition, I think we can say we made some progress. More to do, though, so keep watch for notices for the first of our briefings early next year. I think you're going to find our panels uh, very interesting when we come back after the new year. Our focus today is the climate impact of our refuse and the need to rethink our policies to emphasize reduce and reuse. On April 20th, we held a briefing, Rethinking, Reduce, Reuse, and Recycle, Policies and Programs to Address Waste. If you missed it, I encourage you to go back and watch the presentation and review the materials. We covered a lot of ground during that briefing and learned a lot about some innovative local approaches to waste management. And since then, we've really wanted to revisit waste issues, which brings us to this week. And we start with building materials. If you watch a lot of ESI briefings, you know that we know that the building sector is ripe with potential emissions reductions benefits. From energy efficiency to grid edge technologies to wood construction and embodied carbon, we uncover it all. And back at the second Congressional Climate Camp in February, we were joined by Liz Beardsley with the US Green Building Council. She introduced us introduced us to a building's life cycle carbon footprint. And you can go back and watch her presentation. But for now, I wanted to share two takeaways. The first is that about a third of a building's carbon footprint comes from scope three activities, which are defined as all other indirect emissions like maintenance and repair and end of life. And that's a lot. And the second takeaway is her point that as the grid becomes cleaner and buildings become more efficient, emissions from those scope three activities becomes relatively more significant and more deserving of our attention. I'm very pleased to be joined today by two experts who will help us continue our learning about greenhouse gas emissions uh, from building materials and how to make the most of materials that we've already created. But before I introduce them, I wanted to remind everyone that we have some time at the end of our panel today for questions, and we will do our best to incorporate questions from the audience. If you have a question, you have two options to send it to us. First, you can send us an email. And the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. Or even better, you can follow us on Twitter, at EESI online, and send it to us that way. Our first of two panelists is Jordan Palmieri. Jordan is an environmental scientist and policy advisor in the Materials Management Program at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, where he coordinates projects around the built environment, life cycle assessments, and purchasing. He's worked on building and zoning codes and served as a technical and policy expert for small housing initiatives. He's advised local, regional, and global green building rating systems and leads a, system, and leads a program to help Oregon concrete producers in, develop environmental product declarations, a transparency label focused on disclosing embodied carbon. Jordan, welcome to the briefing today. I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Dan. Um, I'm assuming you could all see my slides and hear me. If not, just please let me know. All right, well, thanks again for the introduction and, and 
um, inviting me to speak today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a few things. Here we go. Uh, we'll start out talking about the carbon impacts of building materials. We'll talk about some short term strategies to reduce these carbon impacts. And then we'll start to talk a little bit about uh, the vision of a, of a, of a longer term strategy um, towards a more circular building material sector. Um, and then uh, Fernanda, the second speaker, will talk a lot more about the circular building economy. So let's jump into it. So when we think about the carbon impacts of building materials, like any product, um, building materials have a life cycle. Um, you know, they're, they're extracted. Um, they're transported, they're manufactured, they're, they're used and eventually disposed of. And emissions um, over a building materials life cycle um, happen all over the place. Um, they happen all throughout this chart. And typically when we talk about the carbon impacts of building materials, we use a term called embodied carbon. And embodied carbon are all the emissions that come from building materials from these life cycle stages, right? Um, and these are becoming increasingly more important because they're starting to show up more and more in our greenhouse gas inventories at, at whatever level we're doing our greenhouse gas inventories. Here in this slide, we see global CO2 emissions, and we can see that building materials comprise about 11% of all material of all of those emissions. In my home state of Oregon, um, we see a similar picture, slightly different because we're um, actually constructing less than the globe is. Um, um, and, but either way, in Oregon, we see about 30% of all emissions are from um, buildings, and about 8% of those are from the materials. So we see that um, building materials are, are, are starting to play a large role. And, and a lot of people are starting to pay attention a lot to um, um, new buildings in particular, um, and, and one of the reasons we pay attention to new buildings and embodied carbon is because as we compare the embodied versus the operational carbon um, over time, we can see that the embodied carbon um, is a big deal over the first 10 years of a building's life and, and even over the first 30 years. And, and we know that in the climate arena, we need to take big actions here um, in the next 10 years. So let's take a look at this chart where it has um, a newly constructed office building. And what we see is right from the start, that big yellow bar on the left are all the upfront embodied carbon emissions from manufacturing and producing those building materials and getting them to the site. Um, and that's a big pulse of emissions right at the start. And then we see two different scenarios. One is a standard code building, a performance building. And as we use that building, as we use energy in that building, emissions occur over time. But we can see those emissions are quite small compared to that first big upfront embodied carbon. And so over the first 10 years of the building, what we see in this chart is that embodied carbon of the materials comprises anywhere between 38 to 67 percent of all the carbon in the first 10 years. Uh, that's a lot. And as we extend out to um, 2050, you know, a, a common next climate target, we still see embodied carbon makes up a significant portion of these emissions. And, that, and then, of course, like Dan said in the introduction, when we're building, you know, zero energy buildings, the only thing making up the carbon emissions are the materials. So, so this is why we're paying more and more attention to embodied carbon, because it matters a lot in the short term opportunities. Um, in, in particular for buildings, and, and it also matters in the long term for our materials economy. So there's a bunch of different ways to reduce embodied carbon. We're going to talk a little bit big picture in this talk today. Um, and uh, so let's, 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 let's start going down this list. These are listed in the order in which um, their ability to reduce emissions, right? So, so the best thing you can do is the first at the top is just to build less. When we're consuming fewer building materials, we have our best chance of reducing emissions. The vast majority of emissions from building materials are in the production of those materials. So we need to figure out ways how to reduce production related impacts first. Obviously one, another way is to reuse existing buildings in their place. How do we reuse buildings rather than um, always having to build new? Building smaller, right? Um, this, this is where occupancy matters. Um, having 5,000 square foot homes and two people in them is, is not always the best use of space, materials, or energy. 
Um, we obviously need to be reusing materials. We'll, we'll talk about a couple of policies about material reuse. Um, when we are designing new buildings, we really need to optimize these buildings, um, both for shape and structure and um, long-term durability um, and so on and so forth. And we have tools to do that today called whole building life cycle assessment. Once you've actually chosen your materials, what you're going to do, you can then optimize those materials through asking or requiring EPDs, environmental product declarations. We'll talk about those as well. Um, there's a lot of different ways to optimize materials. And then finally, last but not least, is to minimize the waste during construction and then recover as, as much as possible. So you see that recovery there, recycling, um, is all the way at the bottom of the list. It certainly has value, but we'll talk a little bit about how there's we need to be thinking about the whole life cycle of materials here, um, not just the recycling of them at, at the end of life. So that's, that's sort of the big picture of how to reduce. And now for the next um, few slides, we're gonna talk about different reduction strategies. And, and in these, I'm gonna be talking about policies that are happening, that are actually happening around the country and being implemented. And um, we'll kind of pop through these at a high level. So the first one is when we think about zoning and zoning controls where we build, how big we build, so on and so forth. And um, in the city of Portland, uh, they just passed new zoning regulations that actually limits the size of single family homes to about 2,500 square feet. Um, this is quite a reduction. You, they, they used to be able to be built almost double this size. Um, but there's also other allowances, recognizing that if you're going to be, be building multiple units, um, two or three units, you're allowed to build larger than 2,500 square feet. If you build your unit to be more adaptable over time, to have an accessory dwelling unit, you're also allowed different allowances. So this is a recognition that you know, materials and space matter, and, and how do we use them more wisely? When we think about new construction being permitted, um, Vancouver, BC, um, is the first place in North America, at least, to require that newly constructed, a portion of newly constructed buildings measure the impact of their building materials at the time of permit. Um, it's really hard to reduce your impacts if you don't know what they are, right? So measurement and disclosure is one of the first policies that we want to see implemented in, 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 um, in terms of embodied carbon. And Vancouver is leading the way there. Back to city of Portland and in Portland, Oregon, they uh, passed the, the first in the nation deconstruction requirement for residential homes built between before 1940. Um, again, this is not only the value of the materials um, uh, at the end of their life and their ability to offset the, the production related impacts, um, but this also builds in a material economy. Um, it, it builds jobs, it builds um, and, and, it, and it is able to, you know, um, train a different type of workforce than maybe we've had in the past um, within the material sector. Uh, this is a great program in Portland. Another effort we see all over the place at this point um, is the use of environmental product declarations for public purchasing. These, these policies are often called buy clean. And um, what they do is they require EPDs um, for certain building materials. And then the, the, the government purchasing of these building materials it would do two things. It would require the EPD, which requires a manufacturer to measure and disclose impacts. And then over time, they would actually put carbon limits on their purchase of specific building materials. At a state level, this is now passed in the state of California and Colorado. There's been other efforts um, in other states that have not quite passed the legislative hurdle. Um, and there's also been efforts at the federal level um, through what was the Clean Futures Act um, to again require EPDs, and there may be more efforts in the past and in, in the future at the federal level as well. Um, so EPDs are a really good tool. Um, what they are are basically like nutrition facts labels, like you'd see on a box of cereal, but instead they're on building materials, and they disclose how much carbon was emitted in producing the building materials, how much how much energy was consumed, and other environmental impacts. Um, they are third party certified, and and EPDs are are great and uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, uh, they really help the manufacturers of these materials identify where the hotspots are. Where are the impacts and, and where can we target first to reduce these impacts? And then obviously they give the consumer 
um, an opportunity to choose lower impact materials. So, so EPDs are, are really beneficial in a number of ways. You could think of them kind of like, um, you know, Energy Star labels, but instead of measuring the efficiency of using a product like a, an appliance, it's, it's more about what is the efficiency of producing the product to begin with. So, so both of them matter and, and, and EPDs help fill that gap. Um, we like EPD so much here in Oregon. We, we had a program um, for the last three years with concrete producers where we provided technical assistance and financial incentives to get these things on the market. Um, we were successful and then we got you know, over 1,500 EPDs published. Um, there may be a role for more public incentive programs in the future when we look towards Europe and see some of their um, more advanced policies around building materials. Um, a lot of them do involve um, public uh, dollars and funding to get these programs going, not only for manufacturing and disclosure, but also for innovation, right? We need to be able to support our industries in that way. Um, back to City of Portland, they have a, con uh, a, a concrete procurement policy that on a local level is basically like a buy clean um, policy at a local level. They require EPDs on local city projects. Um, they are setting uh, GWP limits. GWP is global warming potential, it's carbon right now um, and those are expected to be, to be published in a couple of months um, and then finally everybody needs to meet these thresholds at the end of the day if you want to bid on a city project you not only need an epd but your your carbon values need to be below a certain um, threshold set so this is this can be done at the local level at the state level at the federal level there's there's a lot of opportunity for these different buy clean policies and the thing that's um, great about working with the city of Portland on this is that they recognize that for certain materials like concrete, you know, people need to touch and feel this material and see how the low carbon alternative um, sets differently, uh, travels differently, and, and, and understand that you have a whole workforce behind you that, that is also responsible for, you know, the proper installation of this material. So they've been running pilot projects. Um, to demonstrate that these low carbon materials can be used in the field, that they can be used um, by the traditional workforce doing this work. And, and so here is one of the pilot projects they were doing um, on uh, ADA sidewalk ramps. And they've been a great leader in the field because they're, they've gone on to do a number of other pilot projects to say, well, how does low carbon concrete work in driveways and ADA ramps? And what this is doing is, is it's helping them not just put a mandate forth, but say, help the whole workforce come up to speed on, on what it's like to use these mixes. And, and they're finding really great success. We also see another policy pathway for carbon reductions um, through building code. Uh, Marin County in California was the first county to um, institute limits um, on, on concrete. And again, these are carbon limits for different strength classes of concrete. And so building code is another pathway for that. And then the last um, couple slides here is sort of a transition. So those are all things that are happening now, right? These are policies that will they'll affect carbon emissions right now. And um, we're gonna talk a, a lot more after this about sort of a longer term vision of a more circular building material sector. And I'm just going to start us off with sort of one example that we're exploring locally here um, in Oregon and kind of speaks to the, the full life cycle of, of a material. And, and this one in particular is glass. You know, when we talk about waste and when we talk about recovery, um, glass is one of these materials that, that we have challenges with all over the country, not just in my home state of Oregon. And um, when we think about what to do with glass, this is a really good example of, of how to, to, to use the science and how to use information to figure out what the highest and best use of this glass is. Um, in this case, in this chart here, what we see are, are the carbon impacts all the way at the top of producing one ton of glass, right? And so that's that big bar to the right. Any of the bars that go to the left are benefits. Any of the bars that go to the right are impacts. And so that's the production related impacts of one ton of glass. If we go all the way to the bottom of the chart, we see that if we reuse that container rather than um, recycling it or landfilling it, if we actually reuse that container, take it back in its form, wash it and reuse it again, there's tremendous environmental benefit. That's a really big bar on the bottom. 
if we start stepping up the chart, we see that recycling that glass bottle into fiberglass insulation, which is a, another typical pathway, has, has benefit, but considerable le considerably less. That bar is a lot smaller. Um, the other thing we see is that when we go up and we recycle that bottle into a, another glass container, again, there, there's benefit here, but it's a considerably less benefit um, than reusing the bottle. Um, a lot of people think there's a ton of benefit in recycling glass into glass because it's, it, it can keep going infinitely. And yes, there is environmental benefit, but we need to be, um, we also need to melt that glass down again. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy to do that. So when we avoid melting glass down to make new glass shapes and we reuse the container down on the bottom, we see a lot of benefit. So we need to be thinking a little bit more broadly. Um, and in some cases, back to how we used to do things with glass bottle containers. Finally, I want to point to this other big bar we see to the left is, you know, recycling to what's called a pozzolan. A pozzolan is a cement substitute. Now, we just learned that concrete has a lot of big impacts. So we're trying to figure out how to reduce the impacts of concrete. And one of the ways is to use less cement. We can actually use glass by grinding it up into a fine powder and using it as a cement substitute. And it's working um, in a number of places around the country. And so we've been trying to encourage, knowing this information, a couple of things in the state, um, both recycling of glass into glass pozzolan. We've been trying to attract, attract manufacturers of glass pozzolan to the state to help, help concrete producers have availability and supply of this material. And there's also um, container reuse programs that have been started by the Oregon Beverage and Recycling Cooperative around the state of Oregon as well. So we like to, when we think about a circular economy, we really need to be not just having our blinders on to say, you know, closed loop recycling, right? Glass bottles right back into glass bottles. We need to be thinking more broadly, not just about glass here, but about all of the materials that flow through our economy. So this is where I'm gonna stop. And um, I thank you for your attention. I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Jordan. That was a great presentation. <clears throat> um, also very nice slides. Thank you for those. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to go back and revisit Jordan's presentation or slides, they're all available at www.esi.org. Um, I am really looking forward to the discussion, but before we get to that portion of our panel to our uh, program today, uh, we will get to hear from our second expert panelist. And so let me introduce uh, Fernanda Cruz Rios. She is an expert in circular economy in the built environment. She is an architect by background, and she received her PhD in civil, environmental, and sustainable engineering in 2018. And she just completed a postdoctoral appointment on a transdisciplinary circular economy project at the University of Pittsburgh. Fernanda, I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. Take it away. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you everyone for being here today. Let me share my screen. Okay, okay. Does that look good? Great. It looks great. Okay, thank you. So now, after uh, Jordan's great presentation, uh, I want to invite you all to take a step back and to understand this long-term vision of the circular economy uh, in the built environment and what policymakers can do to enable it. And when I say built environment here, I mean everything from building materials to city infrastructure like roads and distribution systems as well. So now I want to, sit to show you a vision of how this circular built would look like. So first, buildings would be designed for the construction. Uh, that means using modular and prefabricated components with demountable connections like boats instead of a welding or adhesives, for example. And that way, building components are easy to maintain and to repair, and they can be detached from, from the building. And that is important because buildings are made of several components with different lifespans. And design for the construction allows us to remove these components, um, even an entire facade, for example, without having to demolish the whole building. So these building uh, components, products, and materials would have digital tags that contain information like their location, the properties, like structural strength, for example, and chemical composition, even the uh, environment uh, pro uh, um, product labels that Jordan introduced as well. Uh, the quality, also data about environmental impacts, financial values, you name it. 
So these digital tags uh, are called material passports and they are already being developed and tested. So when we're going to build or renovate a building, imagine that we can use materials and products from the existing building stock. So what, from what we already have in the city, uh, we call that urban mining. And the buildings in our cities would work as material banks and that would replace the need for mining new materials, ideally. But we need financial business models that are compatible with this new way of doing things, right? So these are called circular business models. So for example, we can lease building products in systems instead of uh, buying them, like we already do, for example, with solar panels. So the manufacturer owns the product and provides maintenance and repair over time, right? So when it's time to replace that building product, the manufacturer will take it back and reuse or remanufacture uh, and then lease to other buildings. So how can we get there? What can policymakers do to help that? Um, I'll present now a few enablers that were part of a research I did with building designers in the United States to understand the barriers for circular economy in building design. And I'll focus on the solution here, but uh, the whole publication with complete list of challenges and opportunities is going to be available as a supplementary material for this presentation. So in a national level, we need a shared vision of circular economy, and we need an action plan that would inform and guide states and cities uh, in, in developing their own local circular economy strategies, like Jordan was presenting for Oregon, for example. So in these plans, we also need clear targets and metrics and indicators to monitor our progress. Here I brought three examples of circular economy action plans at different scales. So we have Amsterdam, Australia, and European Union. Some of these plans, uh, they are structured around the material. So for example, Australia has identified the main waste in resources streams like plastic, glass, paper, and tires, and they developed a circular economy plan around those materials. The other two action plans developed their plans around different sectors like electronics, uh, packaging, food, textiles, and construction. But regardless of the way that we structure our action plan in the United States, it is important to consider the intersections, right, and the need for collaboration across scales, across sectors, across disciplines, and also the integration of top-down and bottom-up initiatives as well. One of the main challenges that I've identified in the United States is the lack of awareness and information about circular economy. So for example, that includes not only construction stakeholders, but also the general public. So it is critical to develop educational campaigns to raise awareness about circular economy. And that can be done from K-12 education, like this example here um, in Italy on, on the left, to university curricula and to industry training and certification programs. So for example, uh, we could require knowledge on circular economy and like design for the construction, for example, to for someone to get a professional engineer license, for example. And another, sorry, it moved a little bit here. So another critical education problem is that many stakeholders do not understand the difference between uh, circular economy strategies like reuse and recycling. Jordan just talked a little bit about that. So not all circular economy strategies will have the same environmental benefits, right? If you look at this famous diagram here in the, in the left by the Ellen McCarter Foundation, what usually happens is the smaller the loop, in this blue loops here that you can see, the smaller the loop, the smaller the environmental impacts of the strategy, usually. So if we reuse a steel beam, for example, in another building, who have minimal environmental impacts with uh, transportation, for instance. But when we recycle that beam, the recycling process will consume energy and create carbon emissions, much like what happens with glass. Uh, so also the efficiency of recycling uh, varies according to each material. So less than 10% of plastics get recycled, but for example, 98% of all structural steel is recycled back into new, uh, new steel products without losing um, their physical properties. So creating targets and policies that differentiate between reuse and recycling is key to harvest uh, the full potential of circular economy. 
Now, another very important thing uh, we can do is to incorporate circular economy principles into public procurement. Uh, Jordan also talked a little bit about that. So the doc, this document here on the right is a document from the European Commission that is also available to download with this presentation. And it gives us some examples of how to create circular procurement models. So I've mentioned a few examples before, like circular business models that are based on leasing and take back systems. There's also design for disassembly and deconstruction and the identification of materials like immaterial passports or in, in EPDs as well. And here's an example in Amsterdam. So they build a road that the road will remain the property of the construction company. So what happens is that the construction company will maintain this road and as a consequence of this business model, the maintenance, the maintenance condition will be managed more uh, closely. So likely the quality of this road and the, the, this road will, uh, will, be, like, will have higher quality and last longer. Um, and it's more likely that the materials can be upcycled at the end of its life cycle as well. And so besides public procurement, uh, building permits give the city authority right over what's built. So that means that we can include targets for savage components. So components that are reused from existing buildings in the building codes. So here's some examples of uh, common building materials on your, on your labs, common building materials that can be reused from other buildings like brick, wood, glass, metals, insulation, and gypsum. There's several others as well. So reusing these materials should obviously come with safety considerations. That's important to mention. So uh, we have to make sure that these materials are free of hazardous chemic chemicals, for example, and they have appropriate um, structural properties too. And here we have a very important measure um, at a national level, which is to allocate federal funding to research and to development initiatives that focus on circular economy. Uh, I was a part of a workshop uh, for circular economy experts where our goal was to inform the National Science Foundation of research opportunities that should be funded, um, including specific strategies to the built environment and to other sectors as well. Uh, this report that has the, the complete report will be available to download as well. But here about some examples of uh, some research that really need to be done. So for example, creating, creating innovative bio-based materials that can be biodegradable um, after, after the life cycle and some technologies to disassemble existing buildings as well. Um, we have to develop the material passports technology, uh, especially in combination with other technologies like Internet of Things and blockchain. Uh, we have to develop, like, like Jordan said, circular economy pilot projects. So we have to fund this pilot project so we know what works and what needs uh, future improvement. And a very important one that I, need, I want to stress is that we have to map material flows and building component stocks. So we understand what we have in our cities, uh, what kind of materials we have, where they are, where are they coming from and where they are going. So for example, there is this uh, research project that was done um, here that I brought for you as an example. And while we don't have the material passport technology, so we don't have an actual database knowing exactly where these materials are, there are methods that we can use to estimate uh, the material stocks and to map them. So what, what, does, what good does it do to us? We can help connect demand and supply of these materials. We know where they are and we know uh, when we need them, we know where they can come from. So we can help close the loops that way and reuse them. And today, uh, another big challenge that we have in the built environment is that many building codes and regulations, they have, uh, they make strategies like adaptive reuse and using savage materials in buildings unfeasible. So for example, uh, so adaptive reuse is when you re renovate an existing building for a different purpose. So for example, converting an old school building into a museum. Uh, so some regulations make this unfeasible, like there's a standards for parking space, high density, uh, land use restrictions and zoning as well, and some, even some elements of fire codes, for example. So building 
um, codes and, and these land use regulations need to be reviewed with circular economy and reuse in mind so we can eliminate these burdens when it's safe and when it's possible to do so. And finally, it is critical to create fiscal incentives for the circular economy, right? So our construction industry is very risk averse and very resistant to change. So creating economic conditions to encourage these changes is key to enable circular economy in the built environment. Um, a Swedish author has just proposed a circular economy taxation framework. And I also uh, put this, uh, this his paper is gonna be available for download as well. Uh, so what he proposes to create three different types of uh, fiscal incentives over the product's life cycle, which would apply as well for building products. Uh, so first, in the material production stage, there would be a virgin material resource tax uh, for the extraction of new materials. So that would be this uh, high, so higher taxes on extraction of new materials. These taxes can be applied to the manufacturers, uh, but also to the retailers and to the final consumers when we are talking about consumer goods. And then we would have a reuse and repair tax relief uh, that would, he proposed that to encourage repair and reuse practices and also to make them more affordable and more available in our industry. And then at the end of the, the, the product's life, we would have a waste hierarchy tax, which is related to when Becca was talking about uh, that we need different policies that differentiate between circular economy strategies. This is exactly what, the, what he's proposing here. So that means that the taxes would decrease progressively following the waste hierarchy. So for example, there will be higher taxes for landfilling, lower taxes for recycling, and then zero taxes for any level above recycling, like reuse and remanufacture, for instance. So th this is what um, he proposes in, in this paper. Um, and finally, I know that today's focus, we are focusing today on carbon emissions and environmental impacts, but we also need to make sure that circular economy policies are designed with social justice in mind and at its core. So we need to promote, for example, like Jordan mentioned as well, training and building skills to the workforce now so they can adapt to this uh, circular economy models and materials and techniques. Um, and we also need to ensure that the circular economy models will employ decent labor conditions. So we don't just repeat the same inequalities that we see today in the so-called linear economy. Um, we also need to enable the active participation of communities and the decision power of communities in the way that we design our buildings and our cities. So for example, we need to be careful to avoid some unintended consequences um, like environmental racism and gentrification. When we make circular economy decisions, so for example, when we decide which neighborhoods we are going to uh, renovate, which inf infrastructure we're going to renovate, and where our waste uh, recovery facilities are going to be. Um, the Amsterdam Circular Economy Plan uh, that I presented in the beginning is a great example of a plan that was designed with this kind of social considerations as well. Um, and that's what I had for today. I will stop here and we can open for discussions. And I would just like to thank you again for having me here today. A fabulous presentation, Fernanda. Thank you so much. Um, Fernanda, you, over, and Jordan, I'll invite you to turn your uh, video back on. You mentioned lots of materials that you provided. And just so everyone knows, in addition to the archived webcast, the slides that Fernanda and Jordan presented, all of the materials that Fernanda referenced, the complimentary materials are posted on the same briefing page. So when you're looking at her slides or Jordan's slides, you don't have to go very far to get to those, those other materials. So thanks for sharing those with, with us, by the way. Um, we are going to turn to questions. We have a solid 20 minutes, which is great. If you have any questions in the audience and you'd like to send them to us, you have two options. You can send us an email, ask. Um, e the email address is ask at eesi.org, A-S-K. You can also follow us on Twitter at EESI online. Um, I'm going to ask um, a couple questions uh, until we can start getting some from the audience. My first question is something that both of you touched on, but I'd like to give us an opportunity to do, maybe take another pass at it. And that is what I'd like to um, explore a little bit more about how recycling differs 
from reduce and reuse. So conceptually, I think we all understand that definitionally recycling is a different word. It means a different thing. But from a climate impacts perspective, could you explain a little bit more about why recycling is different and how it's different and how it might in some cases be suboptimal? And Fernanda, since you have your, your mute button already off, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll go back to Jordan. Okay, sounds good. Um, there's some research that already showed that despite us increasing the level of recycling and, and, and uh, the mass of materials that we are recycling, we are still failing to uh, reduce our carbon emissions in our industry. So we have enough evidence to say that recycling is not enough. And like Jordan and I was saying, the main problem is when we reuse something, say when you, so these laptops that we're all using right now, right? So when you give it to your kid, you're changing the user and you're keeping the function that's reusing. You're having no environmental impacts whatsoever, unless like, I don't know, your kid lives in another place, so you have some emissions when you drive this laptop to, to your kid, right? When you send it back to the store uh, for a discount on a new one, you are, uh, the store is probably going to, going to remanufacture your laptop, right? So they're going to change parts and issue a new warranty um, so then someone else can buy it. That has more increased impact because, you know, you, have, you may need some new uh, materials to, new parts to compose that laptop. Uh, but if you send it to recycling, uh, you know, it's going to be crushed and separate. Some materials are going to be separated to be recycled. Um, and we, like Jordan said, we're going to have energy. Um, we're going to spend a lot of energy doing this sometimes. We're going to spend a lot of, uh, we're going to uh, issue a lot of carbon emissions. So it, is it better than having a new one? Yes, it is better. Um, but at the same time, it is, it is, this, like I said, like it's suboptimal. We, there's all the, the strategies that we can do that you, you have usually smaller, ben, uh, uh, bigger benefits for the environment. And I say usually because it's, it's very important that we conduct life cycle assessment and actually quantify this, this environmental impacts because uh, like he was saying with the, the glass that varies from material to material. I'll, I'll let Jordan talk too. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Right, that, that was right on point. And, and I think one of my colleagues likes to sum, sum it up and say, recycling is necessary, but insufficient. And that, you know, when we look at a materials life cycle, um, most of the impacts are in producing that material. And I think what confuses people is that when we look at ways to reduce production related impacts, getting more recycled content is one of those ways, right? But but it, it, it's not the only way. And we talked about a bunch of other ways to, to reduce the impacts of materials today. Um, and I think fundamentally, you know, and we've done analyses that said, well, what if um, we recycled 100% of the things coming through the municipal solid waste stream? How much more would it would carbon emissions would we get? And, and it was incrementally small. And, and we know that you know, um, so we know that it has benefits, we know that it's a part of the solution. Um, because there's so many other things around the recovery economy um, that are beneficial besides just the carbon impacts. Um, we, you know, we haven't talked about toxicity. We haven't really talked about jobs. We haven't, um, we haven't ta talked about local economies. And so, so these are all important aspects of the recycling um, economy um, as well. And I think fundamentally, we are just consuming materials at a pace far, far faster than we could ever supply through recovered feedstock. Um, so that's, that's why we need different solutions. Great, thanks, that was very helpful. Um, and Jordan, I'm gonna stay with you for a response to this second question, then we'll turn to Fernanda for her comment. One of your slides, you had this slide on the left-hand side, you had the tall yellow bar representing sort of construction and then you had the two, the light blue and the dark blue bars talking about standard performance and high performance building. Something that our congressional audience hears a lot about is energy efficiency, um, which is a good thing, um, very good thing. Um, how would you, how would you recommend staff people think about um, emissions embodied in building materials? How is that related to the energy efficiency of a building and the building's energy consumption? Do you have any? trying to sort of relate what we've talked about today to something that I, I know that they already hear a lot about and it's very, very important and I'm hopeful that you can help us make a connection there. 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the way that building materials, I, I would say, di directly relate um, to the energy efficiency of a structure is, is, is mainly through insulation materials um, and mechanical systems that we use to heat and cool our buildings. And so, you know, we'll, we'll start with insulation materials. Um, the, the type of insulation really does matter. Um, and um, we're becoming more and more aware of this, um, you know, uh, especially, uh, you know, we, we used to use a lot of foam on buildings, this, this extruded polystyrene foam. Um, and it, it was a great, great product for a couple of different reasons. It had great insulative value. It would easily insulate our buildings. But then we use we learned that you know the blowing agents the, the actual chemicals that we use to manufacture this foam um uh and and the, the chemicals that is actually embodied in some of the foam that can be released over time has a super high global warming potential in that when these 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 uh, chemicals are released um they trap a lot of heat and so you were going through a lot of effort to insulate your building but what you didn't realize is that it was going to take you 30 to 40 years just to make up for the impacts of those materials before you started seeing any of those energy efficiency gains so number one um insulation matters and there's a bunch of different impacts thankfully we've seen the the blowing agents being used in the insulation community coming down a lot in the last five to ten years which is great um, so insulation matters quite a bit um regarding efficiency and then i would say that uh, additionally like there's a lot of electrification going on in the building world right now and um when we electrify our buildings um to lower the carbon footprint of our energy consumption and also use energy more efficiently these are all good reasons to electrify our buildings um we're also able to use you know solar panels on the roof and renewables to off offset energy one of the issues we see happening with with electrification is that we're using heat pumps again that have refrigerants that which are materials that have high global warming potential and so we've seen federal legislation um our, or federal um federal work coming out on that over the last six months around refrigerants which is great news um i think there's there's a lot more that we could be doing in that arena as well so so those are sort of very direct ways that materials meet um efficiency um, and then we also have, you know, different ways about, you know, shape and structure and orientation of the building, um, which Fernanda probably, as an architect, probably knows a lot more about than, than I do. So I'll, I'll stop there. That was super helpful. And Fernanda, I'll turn it over to you for your response. Yeah, I have little to, to add to that, actually. It was a very good explanation. Um, I, I had the same the same comments about insulation and how some materials that uh, even like when we do use some kind of system, for example, if we reuse a steel framing system that has a continuous insulation, and I did a research on that, and we found that the impacts of the reuse can be undermined by the, the environmental impacts of the insulation. So that's something that we have to consider as well, how to close loops for these materials. And um, one thing that I can talk about a little bit is how uh, circular business models can help us, um, say, tie, tie the loose end. So, for example, um, we can have high efficiency. Imagine that the city needs um, a high efficiency, um, I don't know, roof structure, roof system, because it, it also, you know, it, it also um, impacts a lot in the energy efficiency in the building. So. Imagine that we need this in, in public buildings, but the, 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 it's expensive. The new technology that is, um, for example, zinc roofs, they can be extremely expensive. Uh, and what circular business models can do is that you can lease this material. You can still harvest the environment, the, the environmental benefits over the life cycle for, uh, say, for uh, having a high energy efficiency in your building. But uh, since you're leasing it, you have lower uh, upfront costs, so you can actually invest in energy efficiency and, and save funds to invest in other technologies or anything else that you're needing. And then at the end of the life cycle, the manufacturer would take this material back, uh, back to using other buildings as well. So that way you can have both a high energy efficiency building and we can rest assured that our materials are going to be reused at the end of the life cycle as well. So we are also taking care of the embodied um, impacts. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that. Um, next question, I'm going to challenge you to look ahead and help us understand sort of where the next big opportunities might be, either policy opportunities or technology opportunities 
that would help us reduce the carbon footprint of the building materials we choose to use. And um, Jordan, maybe I'll go back to you um, for this one and then we'll hear from Fernanda. Mm, big picture question. Um, well, I, I think, I mean, I, I, what I love about this field is that there's, there's so many materials and so many um, opportunities. And so um, one of the things that I've been excited about um, recently um, is, is thinking a little bit more um, about uh, both natural building materials and um, when we use plants uh, like trees or straw or other things for, for building, you know, thinking about how we can match carbon cycles um, in buildings to what, what we see in the natural environment. And, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy sometimes that we, we grow things like trees for 40 years um, and then, you know, a, a, a lot of the, the byproduct um, of, of lumber manufacturing is Put to very short-term products like 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 paper and pulp, and um, those we lose that carbon in, in less than five years. So so how you know why would we be growing something for forty and then losing it in five? And so I think we need to be doing some larger work on the landscape level about how carbon flows through some of the materials that that we that we um, work on. I'm really excited um, about newer technologies. Um, you know, back to sort of more the industrial side of it in concrete and steel. You know, we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, interesting ways um, to, you know, we talked about glass pozzolan and concrete, um, how to use natural pozzolans, how to just use less cement. There's new cement chemistries. Um, there's a ton of, um, there's, there's a ton of things happening with carbon sequestering aggregates and, and how we actually sequester carbon within the product itself. Um, you know, uh, so, so that is happening with concrete. There's, there's new power technologies being thought of in the steel industry. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm excited about from sort of a materials standpoint. Um, I think that from a policy standpoint, one of the things I'm really excited about is, you know, uh, both federal and state levels putting out demand for lower carbon products. And we can do that through policies like buy clean. And um, that, that is really helpful because if, if no one's there to buy it, um, then we're not getting the signal to the market that, that we want it. And so I think government plays a role there. And we also play uh, sort of an untapped role in investing more in, in North American industry um, because there's a lot that we can be, be producing and be proud of here um, that, um, that I think is untapped. Great, thank you. Fernanda, what policies, technologies do you see on the horizon that um, make you especially optimistic? Yes. Um, so one of the things that I had in mind was covered by Georgia, which is material innovation and especially bio-based materials. Um, but also there's a huge problem slash opportunity that we have to think about, which is what are we going to do with what we already have? Um, what about all these buildings that we have that were not designed to be taken apart? Um, how do we map and reuse these materials and disassemble these materials? So building disassembly techniques that, uh, that can actually help us bring these materials apart that were not designed for that. Uh, and also the whole, uh, um, remember the material passports technology that is placing digital tags in the building components. So we have this database that we can uh, sort of match supply and demand. Uh, how are we going to do that for the existing buildings? So there's some research going on about existing buildings, uh, especially specifically for existing buildings, um, to apply these material passports and to access these materials and to actually know what we already have. And it, it's going to get better, especially because now we have uh, building information modeling and, and some design tools that will help us um, have the accurate information of what we have in our buildings as they are designed. But the whole, we need also to look at we, what we already have here and see what destination this can, um, we can give to this. And another thing that I think is critical uh, besides bio-based materials is to increase the durability of our materials as well. Because we, see, we, we are seeing uh, what uh, one of the architects that I interviewed called the Walmart effect, which means we are producing cheap 
um, mass producing cheap uh, building products uh, and, and building systems for, for example, developers that don't really, they, they don't have a long term interest in the building. So their procurement decisions, uh, whatever materials they select to their designs, they don't uh, keep in mind, you know, how it's going to be the durability of that material, what destination that material, because what are they going to do? They're going to buy the building and they're going to sell the building at some point. So this ownership changes affect also how we make decisions. And we need to understand the whole decision making science is another big opportunity to apply to our industry and see how we make design decisions in how we can actually um, encourage um, circular economy. So I think I, I covered some, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that didn't get like too confused. No, it was, it was not at all, it was great. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Could I add one more thing to what Fernanda said? Of course. And I, that was, that was, that was great and on point. And one of the other um, policies that I'm excited about that tied into where you just ended was um, extending the responsibility of products to the manufacturers that are making them through product stewardship. You know, we, we see a lot of um, product stewardship policies that are basically extended producer responsibility, right? Where it's an electronic recycling program at the end of a product's life cycle. So that is a great place to start, right? Um, but we're seeing more policies around the country um, start to t have manufacturers take responsibility over the entire life cycle of their product. And they're gonna be way more incentivized to reduce the impacts upstream of production and figure out how to more circularly use these products when they're responsible over the life cycle. So I'm, I'm really encouraged to see more policies like that as well. That's great. That's something that we covered back on April 20th in our, um, our fir first uh, recycling, um, rethinking, recycle, reduce and reuse briefing. It was really interesting. Um, we are getting close to the end, but I do have one more question. And Jordan, this actually kind of builds on what you were just talking about, which is sort of the policy side of things. So you've described, between you and Fernanda, you've described um, state, local, even international, non-US initiatives. Um, what are some things the federal government could do better to encourage um, either innovation or the kinds of pilot programs that you've talked about around building material reuse? Um, what are some things the federal government could do that would help those um, initiatives be more successful, maybe reach scale faster and help us get out of the, the situation that we find ourselves in right now. And Jordan, I'll, I'll start with you since you ended on policy and then we'll give Fernanda the last word. Sure, I'll, I'll be pretty brief. Uh, I've said it a few times now, but supporting um, buy clean legislation at the federal level that requires EPDs for certain building materials really puts the demand out there um, that we want low carbon products. Um, let's think of EPDs like efficiency labels, right? Like, like the Energy Star label. Um, we need to see more programs and funding for organizations like um, EPA and others um, to be able to collect publicly available lifecycle information, um, including uh, being a data repository um, to have more trust and confidence in this data when we start implementing this um, far and wide. I also think the, the federal government could play a larger role in not just providing the demand, but in providing some of the, the actual funding for innovation um, within industry and also take more responsibility at a federal level for product stewardship. Um, um, like, like we've seen a, a, a recently with um, you know, reuse and repair, um, where there's been a, a bit of a surge on a federal level from that point. So uh, th those are a few ideas. Thanks. And Fernanda, over to you, you get the last word. What are some things that we could do at the federal level to encourage the great work that's being done at the state and local level? Yes, I want to that, um, once again, a, a clear circular economy plan that we can communicate clearly with goals and targets and strategies that would help us allow, not only like uh, allow different states and different cities um, um, policies, but also allow policies that are not directly related to, to, to build environment or to building materials, but affect building materials as well. So if we have that from a top down level, like a clear shared goal that we can all move towards, that's very important. And also I would add um, collaboration platforms and creating platforms for discussion of circular economy that allow different stakeholders to collaborate. So the, the, the most successful circular economy uh, strategies that I've seen 
uh, involve a multi um, uh, uh, network of stakeholders that are really connected in, in some levels. In, in several of those are virtual platforms, and I think right now we are all experts in that. So, so creating this this hubs and this platform so we can collaborate and discuss and exchange ideas between researchers, between uh, uh, NGOs, uh, policymakers, designers, uh, community. So we need the input of everyone. So I think that those will be my two, two cents in this one. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this was such an interesting briefing. Um, and I really, really appreciate um, Jordan, your expertise, Fernandez, your expertise. Um, thanks for sharing your presentation materials and all the additional resources. It, it was a real pleasure learning from you today. Um, as a reminder to our audience, everything you've just heard um, and all the things where Fernando was referring to and slides and all that, it's all available at www.esi.org. Um, thank you very much to our audience. I saw, um, uh, I know we had a lot of people online today, including a lot of staff. So I thank you very much for joining us. I know it's a busy time. It's getting to be crunch time in Washington. And um, these are really important issues and we're gonna be back tomorrow looking at um, plastics and climate impacts of plastics. We're going to be back on Friday um, looking at uh, climate impacts of food waste. So we've got a really great series and um, Fernanda and Jordan couldn't think of a better way to kick it off. So thank you so much. Um, wanted to just very briefly share a couple takeaways um, that I thought were especially interesting. One, I love the idea of thinking of recycling as a process um, as much as it is a solution. It's, I think, uh, Jordan, you were saying one of your colleagues says it's necessary but not sufficient and we have to remember that it has a greenhouse gas emissions impact. Um, the discussion about natural materials is uh, very promising. It's something we think a lot about. Mass timber, cross laminated timber for instance, something that we uh, have covered previously this year. And I think you know the message on energy efficiency is that you know we make choices in building materials and that has an impact on efficiency and vice versa. Um, and we, there are ways we can, you know, make gains on both sides. We just have to be mindful of it. So um, th thanks very much for, for helping me kind of um, uh, reach those insights today. Really appreciate it. Um, we, I mentioned this, this slide that's up right now, this is just a glimpse of our, our week. I hope everyone will join us back tomorrow uh, at one o'clock for climate consequences of plastics. And then on the 10th Friday, reducing emissions by reducing food waste. Um, I would like to close by thanking everyone at Team ESI who made today possible, Dan O'Brien, Omri Laporte, um, uh, Allison Davis, Emma Johnson, uh, Anna McGinn, Amber Totteroff, Savannah Bertrand, and Isabella Clips. Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything you've done today behind the scenes to make today a big success. Um, the last slide that we have is a survey. Um, if you have two minutes, we really appreciate your feedback. Um, we read every response. Uh, we do our best to incorporate your feedback into our programming. If you had any issues with technology or if you felt like your um, comments weren't getting through on time, please let us know. We'll always try to do better. If you have any ideas for briefing topics, um, we'd be happy to hear those too. Um, but we really take your feedback seriously. We will go ahead and wrap it. Sorry for going a couple minutes over the top of the hour. I hope everyone has a great rest of your Wednesday. And I hope even more that we'll see you back tomorrow at one o'clock for uh, climate consequences of plastics. Take care, have a great afternoon.